it seems like everyone wants to know about research because you think about, all right, do I need it for my portfolio? Is it something that I'm actually more interested in doing rather than mainstream medicine? Or, I mean, just what is it? I just kind of want to know. So I currently work as a clinical trials research fellow. A lot of people have been asking, well, how did you get that job? What kind of qualifications do you need? Can I get this job as an international doctor or is it something that's only for British graduates? Let's get into it. If this is the first time you're checking out our channel, welcome. Basically what we do is we run a website that's totally free known as roadtouk.com and it will explain the ins and outs about everything related to the United Kingdom and what it takes for you to work as a doctor in the NHS. So if you've not already, please stalk us on all of our social media. Find us on Facebook, find us on Twitter, Instagram, and of course, YouTube. Don't forget to subscribe. Hi guys, my name is Abreeze and I currently work as a clinical trials research fellow in the NHS. So what is a clinical trials research fellow? Basically, my role is I work as something known as a sub investigator. So I work under a consultant who is the principal investigator or the PI and I am the sub I. And depending on the trial, it can be a lot of different consultants. Now, my hospital is a university hospital and we do a lot of different trials in different departments. So there are trials for neurology, hepatology, oncology, pediatrics, dermatology, so on and so forth. Some departments will have research fellows specifically for the department, like there'll be a derm research fellow, and they will spend all their time only looking at derm-related research. In my current role, however, I'm more about pretty much covering everything else. So there's a couple of us, and we are on what they call delegation logs, which means we've gone through a proto protocol, we've looked at, you know, we've done the site, um, initiation visits, we've tried to understand what is this trial actually about, what is our role in this trial, and what are we trying to accomplish. So there's a lot of little things that go into it. Mostly the first month and a half is making sure your induction in terms of the terminology, because they love acronyms, is up to par and you know what your role is supposed to be. So you try and put together a good CV to show them. Um, and then depending on what other, other requirements they may have, you might have to submit other paperwork. Now, really, what do I do on the day to day? It can vary. So we've got a calendar. The calendar will have, you know, what trials are on today. Um, I have to be on the delegation log to participate in the trial. That means I have, I have to have gone through the training. Whoever is administering the training has to be happy that I know what I'm doing. I have to be signed off by the PI and then I continue to do whatever it is that I have to do. So for example, if it's like a neurology trial, then maybe I have to do an examination of the patient, ask them how they are, talk to them about, okay, how have you been since the trial started? Any kind of adverse events? Has anything happened that we should know about? Because these can potentially be the side effects that we're looking at later on. Have you changed any of your medications? Have you started any new ones? Have you changed the doses of the medications that you're currently on? what's been going on in that regard. So I just generally have like a clinic visit with these patients um, and they are usually done in the hospital. We have a little part of the hospital that's separate where we see these patients and like I said, a clinic setting or on the, in the bay itself, depending on what they come in for. Sometimes they come in for infusions and then we you know set them up for the infusion, prescribe the infusion, stay with them until the infusion is done or it's just a quick, hello, how are you? And we continue on our day. Occasionally we have to drive out and that's always fun. So there might be things in the community that we're doing. Instead of having the patient come in, we go to them. We might go in one of the research vans or I might just drive out myself. So the research department has a little, what they call a pull car. And I just go in it and drive out to wherever they tell me to go. And then I come back and go about my day. So one of my visits are done. I just had to go basically consent some patients on a trial, brought their car back to the hospital, and I'm gonna go out in our vaccine van later on this afternoon for another trial. And I'm really excited about that trial because it involves little babies under the, you know, the age of 12 months, which is always exciting. It's a good change from seeing adult medicine all the time. So yeah, thankfully had a smooth drive not too much traffic, managed to find a parking spot, always the biggest challenge, and the day continues. 
Now you're going to be asking, oh, that's great, Breeze, but how did you get this job? So obviously, this job is not necessarily going to be available at every hospital. Your hospital has to have a dedicated research and development department. Now, how can you know that ahead of time? You can look into it. You can look at the hospital, research the hospital when you're applying and see what kind of things they have available outside of their other departments. Most of the time, I, at least I feel that if it's a university hospital, they typically do have a research and development de uh, department, but that doesn't mean that if they, if they aren't a university hospital, they won't. So look into that. You might see that, like I said before, there are just some specific to departments, and that's fine too. If you are, you know, you really want to do RESP and there's a RESP clinical research trials fellow, and you just want to do that, that's fine. You can pursue that, and that can be something that'll add to your career, that'll add to you. Um, to your portfolio in terms of progression and things that you want to do in the future. But if you're fine doing something like what I'm doing, which is a good mix of different specialties and departments, that's al also okay because it does keep you on your toes in terms of, all right, oh, how do I do that examination or what do I have to think about here? Or what exactly is the, the mechanism of action of whatever I'm hoping to accomplish and what I'm asking from the patients? So I do enjoy it in the sense that you're kind of like, oh, okay. That's what they're trying to achieve, and we think that this medication or potentially this drug, and sometimes these are medications that are already being used in other settings that they're trying to use in a different place. So it's pretty cool to kind of get an understanding of how different things can perhaps be used in multiple places. Aside from that, within this job, the one I applied for specifically, they were looking for individuals who at least had finished internal medicine training or IMT. So that doesn't necessarily mean the jobs that you're going to apply for that are like this will have that requirement. They might have less of a requirement. They may have more of a requirement. But let me just tell you about what mine asked for. So it looked for three years of at least IMT or, you know, two years depending on what you've done, two years or three years of IMT. And they wanted someone who at least has a general idea around research. Now, I'll be the first one to tell you I really don't have much research experience. I had managed to publish something in relation to international medical doctors um, and the stuff that we were kind of doing with the induction process, but that was pretty much it. That was pretty naive otherwise in terms of actual you know, research, you research, the stuff that you think of, like, I'm in a lab and I'm doing stuff. So <laughs> I, I kind of went into it thinking, I just hope I get this job because I'm not really sure what everyone else is bringing to the table. Um, they did, of course, just generally ask, you know, what do I want out of the job? Where am I looking to go with it? So that I think is really important um, for you to know and just be honest to, with them just in general. In terms of how to prepare the application or the job interview aspect of it. I think I'm going to do a separate video on that, otherwise it's just going to get too long here. But I will cover that in another video, like what you can do and how you can prepare. But basically, you can look for these jobs by looking on the NHS Jobs website and typing in Research Fellow or Clinical Trials Fellow and seeing what comes up. Once you do that, you can see which hospitals they're available in, what your responsibilities are, and what you basically can get out of the role. So you're going to ask me, okay, well, can an international doctor get this job? Yeah, of course you can. There's no, there's no restriction on, on anywhere there. It says, you know, you have to be a UK graduate or you have to be in the UK for this amount of time before you can apply. If you meet the criteria, it's just like any other job. If you meet the criteria, person specifications, apply. Even if you're not sure, like I wasn't really sure in terms of my own research experience, how they would take me, just apply. The one thing that you should always remember is that if you don't try, it's not going to not gonna work out is it you're not sure if you're gonna get something if you haven't at least put in the effort and said all right let's just see what happens so that was kind of how I, I went into the job saying well let me just see what goes on and if it works out it works out so don't think that there's any reason for you not to get this job really the day-to-day -day, like I said before can vary so if you're wondering oh is it gonna be a really hectic job is it gonna be more chill I would definitely say it, it, it can vary but I don't think I really felt like a, a real hectic hectic day like when you're on the wards or doing an on-call shift. The nice thing is the role in, in this department, it is Monday to Friday, nine to five, and like literally it is like nine to five. So it's nice to be able to have the opportunity to just, you know, have a life for a little bit, have the weekends completely back and know I can plan things months and months in advance because I know I won't be working that weekend, like I wouldn't be on call. Um, as I said before, sometimes there are days where we have to sit for infusions and if the infusions take longer or if the patient's unwell and we stay a little bit longer, we work it out amongst ourselves. Like, you know, if I stay two hours late, then I'll leave two, hour, two hours early another day. But that's something that we discuss so we make sure everybody's hours stay fine. 
The other thing is what's really nice about this role and it may or may not be available when you're applying wherever you're applying is that we get a day per week for self-development. So this is just like, you know, other things that you can do to augment your portfolio. So if for instance, like me, you're doing a master's, you can do that towards preparing for your master's. Um, if you're preparing for any exams, postgraduate exams, you can, you can study during that time. So it does have a little bit of a cushion for you to grow academically as well as just grow in, in terms of you having a little bit time off, which is always nice. So it's like a buffer year and then you can think about applying into specialty training or maybe you're just happy doing this job and you're wondering about how do you progress in that role. Now you're definitely gonna ask me, well, what about the pay? If it's only Monday to Friday, nine to five, you can't be being paid that that much. I mean, I suppose, but remember, the pay will also vary at the grade at which you're hired. So if you're hired some, as someone who's like post IMT, you're being hired as a registrar. And depending on what level they'll put you at, your, your nodal point as a registrar, that will be what your base pay is. You might get a little extra pay as on top of that base pay, not necessarily as out of hours, but just more of a in case you go out of hours or if sometimes there's something on the weekend that needs to be done or so this is just more about flexibility um, and then you can go about just living your life with that money. The nice thing is, even if you feel like, oh, well, I'm making maybe two or 300 pounds less than I was when I was on call or something like that, you know you've got all your weekends, you've got your afternoons as well. If you want to locum, you can. Nothing is stopping you from locuming in the hospital. So that could augment your, your salary very easily without you having to stress out too much because you know, all right, I will finish at five. If there's a locum shift at five in the hospital that I can pick up, I can pick it up. If there's something on the weekend, I can do that as well. So it's not that you'd be like, oh my gosh, what am I supposed to do now? The other, I guess, perks about the job is that you really get to see another side of medicine. It's really important that you have very good communication in this type of a job because a lot of what you're doing initially is like consenting patients and understanding where they're coming from as well. There are a lot of expectations that go into clinical trials and you don't want to obviously put the patient in a position where they think this is gonna fix all my problems because some of these trials will be blinded. Some of them will be double blinded. Some of them may not be blinded and, and you know, people will come in with varying amounts of expectations and, and wants and questions and things that they're hoping to accomplish because of this trial. So if you're really good at having those conversations, this is a job you can even hone that skill in. If you're like, I'm not really sure how confident I am in that skill, it's okay. It is definitely something you can learn. It is something that we're, you know, we go over a little bit once we started out in the job as part of the induction process, talking about consent and clinical governance and understanding why these types of procedures and rules are in place. But overall, I think it's a pretty nice job to consider if you're interested in this type of stuff. Now, how much of this will be your research? As a sub I, it's not your research, it's gonna be the PI, but there's always an opportunity for you to be like an associate PI or try and work with a consultant about doing something so that you can be in that role. Otherwise, you are at least understanding the research process. From there, if you wanna build upon your portfolio and do more things on your own, you at least have a leg to stand on. You know which way you need to go and what is expected of you. A lot of times people come into it not really sure what they wanna do and then by the time they're in this role, they're like, actually, now I know I, I wanna be this type of a person or this type of a doctor or, or pursue this type of a career. So it does give you that opportunity to breathe. I know a lot of times, especially with international doctors, we're like, oh no, I have to be a consultant immediately. I can't take a break in between, but take a break. I mean, it's like I said before, it's not a race. Enjoy it, learn something new, learn something different and have the opportunity to live a little because this is something really great. And I think it's if it's something that is available to you and you see the job there, definitely, you should definitely apply for it. So last little bits and takeaways. This job is basically a research trial job, which means, oh, okay, yeah, this is how I can do stuff. This is how things are done. You might be asking, do I need GMC registration? More likely than not in this type of role you would. There may be other research associate type posts where you wouldn't need re um, GMC registration, but you wouldn't be working as a, in a doctor's capacity at that point. There are other kind of jobs you can look under the NIHR website for, where you would probably need to have registration, but you would need to understand what those roles and responsibilities are. Those roles, of course, would probably be something for someone with more clinical or research experience. The research role is pretty rewarding in that you have more time with the patient. You can talk to them and you see how the trial is actually affecting them. It can be difficult in terms of the communications that you have and the expectations the patients may have, 
but it's still a really nice thing, I think, to understand because once you understand research, you can understand how medical science is progressing, which is always a good thing in my opinion. Plus it gives you a lot to think about, um, <laughs> which is never a bad thing in my opinion as well. So last little bits, if you find a job like this, definitely apply for it. If you don't get in the first time, it's okay. You'll understand and do it the next time. I will make a video covering what I put in my job profile and what, how my interview went so you guys can understand how to prefer, prepare for that as well. But until next time, if you don't already, please follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, all of our awesome social media, subscribe to our YouTube channel, be on our forum, check out our newsletter, and if you ever feel like you just want to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation, you can always book a personalized guidance session. And I will see you guys next time. Bye.